Hello and welcome. I am Jennifer Whiting. I'm Director of Music at Gary United Methodist Church in Wheaton, Illinois. And I'm honored to have as a guest today, the Reverend Dr. Christopher Pearson, Senior Pastor at Gary Church. Pastor Chris wrote a poem in response to events of May 2020, and his poem affected me deeply. I've been wanting to have a conversation with Pastor Chris to open up the meaning and layers of this poem. So he has graciously agreed to speak with me. And we are recording this for the benefit of others who may want to be in on this conversation. So I would like to welcome everyone who is watching. Thank you for joining us and welcome Pastor Chris. I so appreciate your taking the time to speak with me. Thank you, Jennifer. And I'm just amazed that this simple lament and poem uh, has impacted people in the way that it has and that uh, you thought of taking the time to, to set up this interview. So thank you. Pastor Chris, I would like to ask you to provide two areas of, of context from your personal experience. First, may we begin with a brief description of your time growing up on the south side of Chicago? Please describe your years briefly. And then um, if you would include, please, talking about members of your family who have worked in law enforcement. And then as a second part to this question, would you also please share a bit of your educational background and your areas of study and work? I realize that this is a huge question I'm asking, but I feel that um, that that context helps us to understand the import of your perspective on these weighty matters that are addressed in your poem. Sure, sure, okay. So I grew up on the south side of Chicago in a neighborhood called uh, Morgan Park. And, but really it starts before that. Uh, my parents, when they were married and lived in the area, uh, lived in an area called the Altgeld Gardens. Uh, and Altgeld Gardens was one of the uh, places that uh, provided public housing uh, for African-Americans. Um, most of Chicago was under restrictive covenants, which prevented blacks and Jews, uh, among others of living in uh, different neighborhoods. And so, uh, when my folks moved to Morgan Park, it was our first home and uh, grew up with uh, brothers and sisters and my parents uh, in that neighborhood uh, that was open. We saw the impact of, of white flight uh, in the community uh, as well uh, as I was growing up. Uh, during those years, uh, we had uh, cousins who moved in with us uh, after, after a major uh, traumatic event. And so it was the four of us kids and then my four cousins and uh, my parents uh, just kind of overseeing all of that. Uh, my dad was a police officer in the city of Chicago all the way up until his death uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, when I was a college student at the University of South Dakota. And my mom uh, began as, uh, as a homemaker, but uh, very quickly moved into teaching uh, in the schools as a, an assistant and then as a probation, or not probation officer, but a, a truant officer and, and other things. So I got to go to school and, and some mornings see my mom, which was always very interesting. Uh, I also have a brother in law enforcement and uh, for a long time thought I would be moving in that direction uh, before I received my call to uh, ordain ministry. And uh, I very well uh, remember the day and it was probably the last conversation that I had with my dad uh, when he found out that I was going to be going into the ministry. And he looked at me as he's taking me to the airport and he said, uh, you know, your mom said that you're going into the ministry. I said, that's right. And uh, he said, good. He said, you know, whatever you do, don't be a cop. Then he said, at least not in Chicago. Uh, and so I, I was aware of the struggles that he faced as an African-American, as a police officer in Chicago. Uh, then had a brother uh, who served over 30 years in the Chicago Police Department and is now uh, retired as well. And for a period of time, we actually uh, were in the same community. Uh, he ha had his beat in the same community where I had my first appointment as a United Methodist pastor. Uh, so that's your first question. I can always add more if you have further questions about that. But uh, uh, my educational background, I started off 
at Augustana College in Sioux Falls, South Dakota for my bachelor's and uh, experienced uh, racism there. I was the first African-American athlete that the, the uh, college had recruited. And uh, after two years, uh, I left there and transferred to the University of South Dakota in Vermilion. Uh, went on to uh, do my master's work at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in Evanston uh, from 85 to 88, and years later decided to go back uh, and work on a doctor of ministry and did that at New Brunswick Theological Seminary in New Brunswick, New Jersey, which is the oldest seminary in the United States. And so I completed that degree in 2015. Thank you for sharing that with us. We at Gary Church surely are grateful that you uh, took that calling in the direction that it led you. And uh, we're thankful for the blessing that you are to Gary Church. Would you please take us back to the events of May 25, 2020, and please tell us what led to your writing this poem, which I know began as a personal meditation or reflection for you. Why did you feel compelled to put these words on paper and um, what did the act of writing this poem do for you personally? Sure. Well, you know, I remember the day very clearly, uh, partly because I was in a gathering of area clergy, a large gathering of area clergy online, and uh, so much had unfolded, uh, not the least of which was uh, uh, the killing of George Floyd. And uh, that came uh, so quickly on the heels of Ahmaud Aubrey and uh, so many other things. But we're on this call and the primary focus of that call uh, was among rich, religious leaders trying to figure out how do we reopen our, our churches safely, uh, what are we doing? What are creative ways that we could be in ministry? And as we talked about all of these other things, uh, which are important, they seemed a little bit irrelevant uh, to, to the magnitude of the moment and what I was feeling uh, inside. And so uh, one of our clergy colleagues raised the question, an African-American woman uh, who's also a pastor raised the question, and as to why we weren't talking about it. And so we began to have some conversation, but it stunned me that uh, we were kind of going on uh, with uh, life as usual, business as usual. And it uh, both angered me, frustrated me, uh, caused uh, a shift in my spirit for some time. And so uh, I got off of that and uh, changed into workout clothes and just went for a long walk uh, in the forest preserve. And uh, during that time, uh, that, that phrase, uh, spirit of heaviness and feeling heavy uh, just seemed to come to mind. And uh, after a walk through the forest preserve and back home, I just sat down at the computer and began to type. And uh, what do you see, what you have in front of you, uh, what is this heaviness is a, a result of, of all of that. It's a result of uh, so many experiences that we have as African-Americans uh, and opportunities that we have to address that pain and that suffering and to empathize with uh, others during the midst of their suffering. And uh, the words just, just began to flow as I thought about uh, this heaviness and uh, wondered how does this connect uh, with other people uh, and what they are going uh, through right now in the world. And uh, how can we share uh, this suffering? Because I'm a firm believer that sometimes when we share our suffering as painful uh, as it may be, that uh, there may be others uh, who are also suffering, others who are carrying uh, heavy burdens, others who experience that uh, heaviness uh, and wonder why their soul is downcast and uh, cry out to God. And uh, when we do that and we can connect with each other, I think that's a place uh, where we can start to speak truth and, and move forward together. Thank you. As you mentioned, your poem is titled, What is this he heaviness that weighs on you? And I would really like our listeners to hear the poem read in your own voice. Would you be willing to read it for us? 
I'll, I'll do my best. I wasn't totally prepared for that, but I'll do my best. Okay. Sure. What is this heaviness that weighs on you? The heaviness that weighs on you weighs on me too. I am because we are Ubuntu. Is it the heaviness of Ahmad, of Sandra, of Brianna, or Amadou? Is it the heaviness of Emmett or Mamie? Is it the heaviness of Eric, the heaviness of Erica? Is it the heaviness of Martin, of Malcolm, of Coretta, or Betty? Or is it the weight of unsolved, unpunished, or unnoticed? Is it the weight of unfinished, unwilling, unaddressed? Is it the weight of St. George's, of Mother Emmanuel, of 1619 or 1492. She's my mother too. Is it the cumulative weight of generations of hate? Is it the weight of LGBTQ, of Me Too, or Church Too? Is it the weight of the eyes that watch closely as you pass by? Is it the car with the blue lights that's slow enough to keep you in sight? Is it the purse that is clutched, the whisper, the unnatural hush? What is this heaviness that weighs on you? The heaviness that weighs on you weighs on me too. I am because we are Ubuntu. Is it the weight of calves like cantaloupes? Is it the weight of good people on both sides? Or is it the weight of the China virus, the Hong Kong or Spanish flu? If black lives matter and blue lives matter, and all lives matter, then you should feel my heaviness too. You too could speak up, speak out, act up and act out. Eric can't speak, George can't speak. Though they can't speak, their blood cries out from the ground. With the weight of a chokehold and the heaviness of a knee, they said, I can't breathe. This is the heaviness I feel. I can't breathe, can you, Ubuntu? Thank you for reading that to us. It's powerful to hear it in your voice. Your poems, references, and images are laden with history and ethics. Each phrase invites our contemplation. And many stanzas of your poem um, appear in the form of questions that invite our inward reflection and response. Um, reading carefully is a form of intense listening, I think, and we need to listen, we need to learn, and I would really appreciate hearing you unpack this poem a little bit to open our understanding to some of its layers of meaning. Um, I feel like hearing you read it through gives us um, sort of one, one experience of the poem, but as we look into each line, we find that there are these various layers of intention and meaning. Um, so let's talk about a few of those things, okay? Maybe we can focus in this direction. How does one individual's personal burden of heaviness relate to one's ability to understand the, the black burden or the black experience of heaviness. Mm -hmm. So I'm one who does not believe in a hierarchy of oppression. And uh, each of us has our own personal uh, experiences of oppression in our lives. And in some ways they can be interconnected, uh, if you will. And uh, that experience uh, is unique to us, but others have uh, those experiences that, that kind of weigh on them. Uh, but at the, in the same sense, uh, our personal experience sometimes connects us with a much deeper and longer history of oppression. And so what I experience as an African-American male growing up on the South side of Chicago, is both unique, but at the same time uh, connects with some of the people that I mention uh, in this lament and that I mention in this poem. And uh, thinking about their experiences and their story, uh, the narrative of their lives, even those things that are untold that perhaps I may know as an African-American that others may know, uh, comes together uh, in some ways. 
And so uh, growing up, as you had us begin our conversation, growing up on the south side of Chicago uh, connects me in a strange way to Emmett Till, uh, though he uh, was killed uh, and murdered in a vicious act of hate uh, in another state, but his, his home uh, city of Chicago. And uh, knowing that uh, places where, where I would locate myself, uh, where I walk, uh, could very well lead me to the same fate that he experienced, or the same fate that Ahmaud Aubrey uh, experienced as he was out on a jog on a day, on a given day, uh, or even for that matter, Brianna Taylor, who is at home uh, in her bed. And so there's this long history uh, that I believe uh, we as African Americans uh, feel. I think our Jewish brothers and sisters, uh, for example, might feel that way, not only about the Holocaust, but pogroms uh, throughout history, uh, the impact that that has had on their lives in various uh, cultures and centuries, uh, the role that the church has played in, in their oppression and in uh, supporting anti-Semitism. So that's a little bit of that, but uh, it's also about just trying to draw us together, a sense of human, human connectedness. So while I am an African-American male, uh, I'm a human being. And I pray and hope that there's something that connects us at a deeper level as human beings together, especially those created uh, in the image and in the likeness of God. Mm. I think one of the aspects that you're talking about here is empathy. Um, could you unpack that word a little bit for us? How does empathy play a role in uh, unity and in race relations? Wow, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Uh, what's coming to mind immediately is uh, the transformation that, that I know has taken place in some people's lives. And when I say transformation, I mean a conversion that has moved people uh, from, from one position that was uh, fiercely held, a belief that was fiercely held about the uh, segregation of the races, about uh, supremacy and inferiority, uh, that kind of mindset of seeing somebody as less than human and less worthy. Uh, so you could, for example, think about uh, George Wallace, who was a notorious uh, segregationist, uh, but he didn't end his life that way. Or even uh, a, a Robert Kennedy, Kennedy uh, who was able to connect with the Black experience because he had lost his, his brother, uh, who uh, was felled by an assassin's bullet, and was the first person then to speak uh, to a largely African-American congregation, uh, not congregation, but a group of people assembled in uh, Indiana to tell them of the assassination of Dr. King and could connect that. Uh, to his experience and the death of his brother, who also died at the hands of a white man. And you could just see that. But uh, Robert Kennedy was the same person uh, who, as attorney general, uh, was involved with the wiretaps of Dr. King. And uh, we forget that history uh, in some points of spying on Dr. King and, and looking at ways uh, that they could um, uh, be aware uh, of this person who, in some views, was uh, might become a black messiah. And but this man was transformed. And uh, I believe that that's possible uh, for all of us. And it's through empathy, I believe, that, that that happens when we're able to recognize the humanness of someone else, when we're able to uh, just, you know, identify with something like the African uh, teaching, philosophy, uh, religion, if you will, of Ubuntu, which says that I am because we are, you know, uh, I am who I am because of who we are as a people. And uh, our histories connect, uh, our histories relate us to one another, uh, going back to the dawn of creation when God formed us in God's own image and likeness out of the dust of the earth and breathed into our nostrils the breath of God and we became living beings. And that word breath, that ruah, that pneuma, that spirit of God in us connects us all together. And has profound implications for many things that we are facing in America today, even beyond race relations. So thank you for, for drawing that out. 
in your poem, you um, singled out quite a few people um, and you named them mostly by their first names, Ahmad, Sandra, Rihanna, Amadou, Emmett, Mamie, Eric, Erica, and then uh, the leaders, Martin and Malcolm, Coretta and Betty. Do you have specific reasons why you singled out these particular individuals? Um, is there anything that you would like to say about any of them? Sure, and I mentioned a little bit about uh, Emmett Till, uh, for example, uh, but we think about his mother who made that uh, difficult, difficult decision uh, to have an open casket service uh, in Chicago, I believe at Roberts Temple in Chicago. And, uh, you know, a mother weeping for her child uh, that image, that photograph was on Jet Magazine and in other places around the country. And African Americans saw that brutalized body. Uh, the people who came in witnessed that. And it was, uh, you can still see the videos of that. And it was just unbelievable. Uh, the kind of uh, empathy and connection, the grief, uh, individual and collective grief that people uh, experienced in that moment, but still nothing like a mother uh, going through that experience and uh, deciding uh, to make that that uh, very bold and unique choice. And so if you look at the names in the poem, uh, I talk about Emmett and Mamie, and then I flip it just a bit and I talk about Eric, uh, Eric Gardner and his daughter, Erica. Uh, and so Erica uh, witnessed, as we all did, her father having uh, his last breath videotaped uh, for the world to see and crying out, I can't breathe. And she picked up the mantle in trying to bring about justice uh, after her father's death. And ultimately uh, her suffering, uh, I believe, overwhelmed her. And she died as a very, very young person uh, not achieving any type of full justice, but still working uh, to see that happen. Uh, so just as we had a, a mother uh, who lost a son, we have a daughter who lost her father uh, on that day. And then I look at those who we recognize as leaders. Uh, Martin and, and Malcolm uh, are obvious, but we forget about their spouses, their wives, Coretta and Betty uh, and the, the father of their children uh, who, who was lost, who had their lives taken uh, by assassins bullets. Uh, so those are just a few reasons that I named those individuals. And of course, uh, in that moment, Brianna Taylor and uh, Ahmaud Arbery and uh, George Floyd, all of those names uh, are obvious, but uh, Brianna Taylor's name uh, was one that was not being named. And so uh, there was a movement, of course, with a hashtag, say her name. And um, so often people are not named. Uh, and so I wanted to name individuals, uh, not just statistics. Uh, we could talk about uh, those who have died at the hands of racist violence or police violence and in other ways, but to name them also as individuals and to say that their lives matter. Uh, they don't have to be perfect. Uh, they don't have to be saints. Uh, but whenever someone has lost their lives in an unnatural and unnecessary uh, way, uh, I think it's important for us as children of God to name their names and to say their names. And a lot has happened in the United States since May 25 of 2020. Um, the deaths have continued. The injustice continues. Would you like to talk about any others that... Uh, would add to this list now? Well, I'd actually like to take a slightly different approach uh, because what I also uh, do in the lament is I name places uh, and those places have names as well. Uh, Mother Emmanuel and St. George's uh, are two that I name. And I think we all are familiar uh, with the events that took place in, in Charleston when uh, Dylan Roof uh, entered a place where uh, during Bible study, African-Americans welcomed him, him in their midst, uh, spent time with him uh, for over an hour, 
and he took a Glock out uh, at the end of their time and took the lives of nine people and wounded yet another. And he was fully aware of the significance of Mother Emmanuel and the role that it played as the oldest African, African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, in the South. And it's, it's a rich history uh, that people can look up. But uh, also St. George's. And St. George's is important for us because uh, without what took, uh, without what having happened um, and what took place at St. George's, there is no African Methodist Episcopal Church or AME Zion or CME Church. And what happened at St. George's were that there were uh, African Americans and whites worshiping together uh, in the same place. And white supremacy and racism began to really take hold in that place. African Americans were asked to uh, be seated in another location uh, in the balcony of that church and were lifted up even during a time of prayer. And uh, they left there with uh, Richard Allen and created a society, a benevolent society, which became a church, uh, became a denomination, the oldest African American institution uh, in the United States, and that's the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And uh, Mother Bethel uh, became, became that congregation. And uh, I grew up uh, in that denomination, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, in a congregation on the south side of Chicago, and became a United Methodist because I saw it beginning to wrestle uh, with the issues of race, uh, which um, separated us. And uh, despite our long history of uh, people like John Wesley being a, a, a devout abolitionist, uh, our denomination, the Methodist Church, split between North and South uh, over the issue of slavery, just as our nation did. And uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church South was very interesting uh, when in a very short period of time, when they began electing bishops, every single one of their bishops was a slaveholder. And so we as a denomination uh, have a history, the Southern Baptist Church and the Baptist Church uh, have that same history as our denomination split over the issue of slavery and race. And it's taken us a long time uh, to try to have some form of truth and reconciliation in our denominations, and we're still not there. So St. George's and Mother Bethel and Mother Emmanuel uh, are all sites where I think we need to examine our history and talk about the reckoning and, and reckoning with that history and not miss uh, this moment of opportunity that mm. we have today. That's a very rich perspective and informs our understanding a great deal of what is happening even today. Um, one of the phrases in your poem that stands out to me is, she's my mother too. Can you tell us how you feel connected to Mother Emanuel? You have touched on this just now, um, but on the heels of that question, how are all Christians related to Mother Emanuel? Um, I'll just leave it at that. Sure. So, of course, uh, being baptized in the African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, at the age of, I think, 16 or 17, <laughs> uh, and uh, in some denominations, they tell you exactly what that was, but it was an Easter morning. Uh, that's the church that I grew up in and uh, that my mother uh, raised me in, and my grandfather, uh, uh, maternal grandfather was an African Methodist Episcopal uh, pastor. And so it still holds a deep place in my heart. Uh, that's the place that, that raised me and helped to shape and form me. Uh, the women of that congregation, uh, the pastor of that congregation uh, poured love into me uh, as I made that decision uh, in my life to walk with Christ. And uh, I, I'll never forget that. So it will always be a part of me. Uh, the Lutheran Church uh, is actually going through a very interesting period. Uh, they realized, for example, uh, that Dylan Roof grew up in the Lutheran Church. And so they started to ask the question, how did this happen? You know, what happened here? And uh, how, how are we in some way responsible and connected with this horrific act of violence that took place? And so they are going through a period of uh, 
speaking truth and being connected with the African Methodist Episcopal Church and with others to address and attempt to dismantle racism. Uh, the United Methodist Church has attempted to do that in some ways uh, by having acts of repentance at general conference. And there's still a great, great deal of work to be done. Uh, our congregations are still seg uh, segregated in many ways. Uh, I may be an African-American pastor at a majority white uh, congregation, but that is still an, uh, an exception to the rule. Uh, when we look across the country, what was true in the 1960s when Dr. King said it is true now, and that is that uh, Sunday morning is one of the most segregated hours uh, in America. And so we still have so much work to do. Indeed we do. I believe that your poem's argument moves uh, towards kind of the energy of the poem, moves towards this stanza, then you should feel my heaviness too. So if the reader is able to come to a place of empathy, um, cognitive and emotional identification with um, uh, those who suffer, especially among the black community, then what can and should be our resulting acts of compassion? I would like to ask about next steps, um, as you describe in, um, in speak up and speak out and act up and act out. Sure, and, and that's a tall order. Uh, most of us, uh, I think, because of the way we've been shaped by our faith, uh, tend to look at things from an individual perspective. Uh, we talk about having our personal uh, relationship with God, uh, but scripture is absolutely clear. Uh, we are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but we're also to love our neighbor as ourselves. And when we stop and we think about it, some of the patterns that um, uh, we talked about earlier in the very beginning of our conversation about where I lived. And I was glad that you asked that question. Uh, the reason that I lived in Altgeld Gardens uh, and my family lived there was because uh, we were forced to. Uh, and that's a systemic issue. Uh, that's, that's a deep issue. And oftentimes uh, an individual may not be able to to impact that in, in some uh, large and significant way. Uh, and so we address these things, I think partly by looking at our own individual uh, lives and the decisions that we make, the choices uh, about where we choose to live and who we're willing to live among and have our kids in school, uh, attend school with, but also how do we address these things as a community uh, as a church, uh, a local community, uh, at the municipal level, uh, how do we address these issues as a state on the national level? How do we come together? So one way that I like to talk about it is awareness. So uh, I, I think this poem, uh, this lament may have made people aware of some things if they did uh, the hard work that you did and that I know that you did as an individual uh, to look at these various lines uh, of the poem and to think about what it meant and what it means in our history. But to become aware is just one step. Uh, there's also relationships. And it's one of the reasons I keep coming back to segregation and things like restrictive covenants. Uh, if we live in communities that are uh, homogenous uh, rather than diverse and inclusive, in a variety of ways, not just racially, but religiously and socioeconomically, it makes us hard for hard, it makes it hard for us to have uh, the type of relationships with people that are rich and that can inform us at a deep at, at a deeper level uh, to what some of the inequities and challenges are and how we might move forward. Uh, then the next thing is is simply commitments, and we can make commitments every single day. Uh, to choose to be anti-racist, to choose to go against the trends personally and systemically uh, that keep us apart from one another and keep us from flourishing as individuals ourselves because we can be strengthened in our relationships, but also uh, prevent others because of their race, because of their socioeconomic class or religion, prevents them from flourishing uh, as well. 
And I think about this in a way that uh, Ibram X. Kendi talks about. And he says, really, there's no um, not racist. He says, you're either uh, acting or thinking in a way that is racist or anti-racist. He kind of moves us out of this neutral uh, position. And so uh, when we're thinking, uh, for example, uh, to stop and, and think, am I putting people into uh, categories that are limiting uh, of who they are because of their color? You know, am I making judgments and values about people in that way? Or am I willing to experience uh, individuals, uh, recognize the diversity, but still experience that? Um, am I buying into uh, decisions so when uh, I'm looking for a house and that real estate agent says to me, uh, this isn't a good neighborhood. Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, does that mean that the school system is not a good school system? Does it mean that there's let it uh, water? Does that mean that there are black people or Hispanic people uh, in this community? And, and just simply making uh, decisions each and every day, making decisions on how we vote, uh, and making sure that others have access to the same things that we have access to uh, and that they can live out uh, their dreams and the visions for their lives. Uh, and we find our common humanity uh, when we do that. There's a lot of work ahead for us all. Thank you so much, Pastor Chris, for sharing um, your experience and your, your knowledge, your wisdom uh, I, I'm always struck with your patience in the ways that you teach us. So uh, thank you. And you, as well as your vulnerability, you're, you, uh, you're willing to show us your life. And, um, and that's a very powerful sermon in itself. So um, I think that we've kind of covered my basic questions, but I just want to offer you an opportunity to share anything else that's on your heart or your mind, either for us as a, uh, a community or to Gary Church in particular? Sure. Uh, there's one part uh, in the poem that we did not talk about quite as much. And uh, I asked, is it the cumulative weight of generations of hate? Yes. And went on to, is it the weight of LGBTQ, Me Too, Church Too? And part of empathy uh, from my perspective uh, has been to look again at uh, others who are experiencing oppression, uh, the Me Too movement, the LGBTQ movement, uh, uh, even discrimination within the life of the church uh, around the issue of uh, sexual harassment of women clergy, or even whether or not women will be uh, allowed, permitted to be clergy at all and to affirm the call that God has placed on their lives. And so while I am a person uh, who, because of the way that I grew up, because of the color of my skin and the place that I grew up, and my own personal history have experienced uh, oppression, where are the places I ask myself where I need to grow? And how can I feel empathy towards others who are experiencing oppression in their lives or discrimination. And to look at the privileges that I have uh, as a male uh, in relationship uh, with others, uh, as a heterosexual male uh, in relationship uh, with the LGBTQ uh, community, uh, as someone who has had the opportunity, uh, mind you with hard work, but has had the opportunity uh, to go uh, to not only college, but to go to uh, graduate school to seminary and to then go on uh, to receive a doctorate. That's, that's privilege uh, to live in a country uh, where citizenship uh, brings something unique and uh, to think about uh, our, our immigrant brothers and sisters and uh, what they are experiencing as they seek asylum or refuge uh, within the United States. And so uh, for me, uh, when I hear phrases like calves like cantaloupes uh, that one of our elected officials uh, made some years ago or diseases that are attached to people. I know where that can lead. I know that that can lead to pogroms. I know that that can lead to people talking about a final solution. I know how that kind of dehumanization uh, can shape us for, for centuries uh, and, and, and not in a good way. 
And so I, I just ask all of us to think about that and to use the privileges and the power and the voice that we have to speak up and to act and to act out based on where we find ourselves. And it's gonna look different for each person, uh, but uh, whatever God has enabled us to do and our life story and the place that we're located, whatever that is, let's use our voice in those places. And uh, if all of us do that, I think we are in a much better place uh, to, to kind of accomplish some of the things that I envision for this world where all of these things will not matter. Uh, what will matter is that we are children of God uh, and we are part of God's beloved community. That's a very beautiful place to end. And I too, I, I have felt called uh, to speak, but also to amplify voices that need to be heard. And so I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity, Pastor Chris, to amplify your message in a small way right here. I hope that others will hear and um, will also be moved uh, the way that you have moved me. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank and you. It's been a privilege to spend this time together. It sure has for me. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.